Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Manager for the DC Preservation League. For those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and protecting the historic and built environment of Washington, DC since 1971. So I'd like to take a moment to first acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. Also, as part of our 50th anniversary celebration this year, August programming is specifically dedicated to highlighting the rich histories and cultural resources of Wards 7 and 8. So I'd like to take a moment to thank Karen Gordon of Seattle, Washington for sponsoring this month in memory of her dear friend, Patricia E. Williams. So many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. I'd also like to share some notes about how our program will work today. So please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions of our presenters. Um, I will collect your questions and verbally ask them of our speakers after their presentations. We're also going to give you all the opportunity to like raise your hands and we'll unmute you and then you can ask your own questions verbally. And a few times in the presentation, there's gonna be opportunities to uh, type in some answers to questions in the chat, just so you know. And then for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, DCPL's Community Outreach and Grants Manager, Zach Burt, will be monitoring any questions you might have and will pass them along to us as well. So with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's speakers. Joe Cashman grew up in Anderson, South Carolina. He attended the Air Force Academy and then served in the Air Force for five years. He then got his master's in teaching from the Citadel and taught high school government and economics and middle school uh, South Carolina history for 14 years. After volunteering at Congaree, I'm sorry, Congaree, sorry, National Park in South Carolina for four years, Joe and his wife, Francie, moved to Baltimore, Maryland last year. He has been a National Park Ranger at Kenilworth Park and Aquatic Gardens since this past December. Megan Singleton, community, oh my God, guys, I'm so sorry, my mind. Okay, as community and development associate, Megan Singleton works to promote the exciting programs at the park that inspire curiosity, creativity, and healthy living. She graduated from NC State University in May of 2019 with a degree in fashion and textile brand management and marketing and minored, and minored in arts entrepreneurship. Megan volunteers in cleanup events and writing letters to elders. Sorry again for all my fumbles. And with that, I am so excited to pass things along to Joe. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you guys for having us here today. You sound like a wonderful organization. Um, I'd like to keep learning more about what you do, um, but I like that you guys preserve and protect. And that's basically what we do as park rangers. We preserve and protect um, the parks. So it's great to be here with you today. And um, we're gonna pull up a PowerPoint and um, tell you a little bit about the park and what we do, and then um, talk to you about our great relationship with the Friends of Kenilworth. So you can see here is our National Park logo, along with the Friends and the DC Preservation League. Uh, I'm Joe Cashman, and for those of y'all can see the camera, here's my Smokey the Bear Ranger hat. Um, I get to wear, 90% of why I wanted this job was to get to wear the cool hat. So um, but I'm inside today, um, and, and it's great to be with you. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our agenda. Um, first, I wanna give you a brief history of the park, um, tell you what, why we're here, and then talk about some highlights. So if you wanna come out and visit us, what you can expect to see while you're here. And then I'll hand it over to Megan to talk about um, the friends and our great relationship with them at the park. As we're going, um, I'm a former teacher, as Melissa said, so I like to ask questions. And so I guess the best way to participate would be through chat. Um, so I'll throw you out some trivia questions uh, coming up soon. And if you just type it into the chat, and then we can do questions and answers um, later on. Okay, so um, I wanna start with the brief overview of the National Park Service and what we do. We were started in 1916 um, by the US Congress and this president. And so that's our first trivia question. As a history teacher, I um, wonder if anybody here can type into the chat which president this is, would have been president in 1916 and actually signed the legislation for us to become a park. So let's see if anybody can guess the president. If I don't hear any guesses, hey, here we go. Very nice, Juliet. Um, excellent. So Woodrow Wilson, that's President Wilson, you know, president during World War I, 
Um, good job, Juliet. He he signed legislation to make his park, and also he enjoyed the park. He and his wife would come out to the park. Um, we've got great history on them coming to visit the park, along with President Harding and Coolidge, and their spouses would come out and enjoy our, our gardens. So the National Park Service just turned 105 last Wednesday. We had our 105th birthday. Um, and oh, and I also want to mention uh, President Obama came out to the park. He was the most recent president and planted a tree at our park. But the purpose of the National Park Service is to preserve natural and cultural resources for the education and enjoyment of all Americans. And all, all guests, you know, we get international guests as well. And that's, that's our purpose, which is similar to your purpose. Now, some people get confused because Kenilworth Park and Aquatic Gardens is in the National Park Service, but we're not one of the big 63 national parks. And so I want to talk about the difference. Um, if we look at the next slide, uh, there's 63 national parks. And these are the big parks that you hear of all the time. The Yellowstones, Yosemites. Um, and this is the most recent map I could find, but um, the newest one is in West Virginia, uh, the New River Gorge Bridge. Um, also, the, the Arch in Missouri is a park in Indiana, which is not depicted on this. But these are our big, our big 63 national parks. And like Melissa mentioned, I came from Congaree National Park in South Carolina. Uh, the closest one we have up here is Shenandoah, which I imagine a lot of you have been to Shenandoah National Park. We also have the Great Smoky Mountains not too far away, and then Acadia National Park up in Maine. But the majority of the big parks are out west. And of course, you see some down in southern Florida and out in Alaska. Okay, now on the next slide, you'll see we have 423 different park entities. And those can range from all different things, from battlefields, um, canals, historic canals, monuments, houses. Um, and so you can look all over the country, we have national park entities, and that's what we are here in DC. And one of the biggest reasons is we're in, in federal land. And so because the federal government's in charge of the land, we have that interesting relationship with, with DC that you guys know real well, um, the National Park Service took over the park. We're the only park that is known for the cultivation of aquatic plants. Okay, great. All right, next trivia. So get ready. Um, Julia, you're out on this one. Okay, we, let's get someone else. Name that bird, a common bird you probably see in your backyards, um, but we see a Kenworth all the time. Nice body. Okay, uh, that's the northern cardinal. Okay, and if you see that cardinal, just I'll give you some fun facts about it. Uh, on the left is the male, and the right is the female. Uh, they have large beaks that are good for cracking seeds. Um, a lot of people love the cardinals because they're affectionate towards each other. And it looks like they're kissing. So a lot of times you'll see them in the breeding season, they'll meet beaks as if they're kissing, but they're actually sharing food. Um, but cardinals are known to mate for life. They have a three-year lifespan, so it's a short life. And um, they're also the state bird for five different, excuse me, six different states. So let's see. Um, oh, good job, Pam. You got the cardinal. Can anybody um, type in some of the um, states that have the cardinals as state bird? There's one state that's very close to us here. We'll see how many of the six we can guess. Okay, good. Okay, Bonnie, Illinois, good. Pam, Virginia. Ohio, good, Zach. Ohio, that's right. So we got Illinois, um, Virginia, and Ohio. Okay. Now, just to the west of Virginia, West Virginia um, also has the cardinal. Kentucky. Indiana um, is another one. So we got Virginia, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, North Carolina, Ohio, and West Virginia. So that Cardinal is a popular bird. Also, two sports teams, two professional sports teams are named after the Cardinal, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Arizona Cardinals. So Cardinal is a cool bird you can see out at our park. Okay, Megan, let's take a look. Now for some of the history of our park. Okay, originally along the Anacostia River, we had the, the Nacochtink tribe and they lived along the river they would um fish the river they would do they would plant the three sisters corn beans and squash along the river and that's how they sustained themselves and then in 1608 the english came and captain john smith arrives and the english colonies colonists took over the land either by force or through disease and pushed the native americans out and they started to plant tobacco and tobacco was a huge cash crop brought a lot of money um into the area and into trade, much more than, than fur trading. Initially, they were trading furs, but um, tobacco made a lot more money. Um, so they made a lot of money, and there were, there were um, big tobacco plantations along the Anacostia. Um, there were slaves involved in the production of the tobacco. And so that went on for a while until the tobacco ruined the soil. Tobacco is very bad for the soil. And so after the initial profits from tobacco, the soil got depleted, 
and then the rains would run run the soil off down into the rivers. And they used to be able to ship goods to Bladensburg all the way up the Anacostia River, but with the silt build up, and for those of y'all that have been on a boat in the Anacostia River, it's real shallow. Um, there's still a huge trouble, you know, problems with silt runoff in the Anacostia. And then we get to our founder, um, Walter Shaw. So now we're in 1879. Walter Shaw was born in Maine, and he loved water lilies as a kid, which is interesting. Um, they had white water lilies that grew up there where he grew up in Maine. Um, he got drafted into the Civil War and fought for the United States in the Civil War. And he lost his arm in battle at Spotsylvania Courthouse. So he lost um, the lower portion of his arm below the elbow in the Wilderness Campaign and the Bloody Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. So he went home back to Maine briefly. And then he got a job back in D.C. where he was receiving medical treatment. And he learned how to write with his left hand and um, worked for the Treasury Department. And he actually worked with Frederick Douglass, two of his Frederick Douglass's sons in the Treasury Department, which was interesting. Um, but he eventually got married and bought land along the Anacostia where our park is now. And he started to plant his water lilies. He brought them back from Maine and started to plant them. And he started to grow more and more. And his friends started saying, Hey, you should, you should make a living out of this. You should plant more of these and start to sell them. And so he took their advice and started to sell them and he started a business. Okay. Next slide, please. Oh, here's some images here. There's tobacco being planted. And there's Walter Shaw on the boat there. You can see he's hiding his right arm there behind him as he had lost um, the portion below his elbow. Okay, okay. so now we get to Helen Fowler, uh, Walter Shaw's daughter, Helen Fowler, and she really made the business take off. Uh, she's a very interesting woman. Um, she's the first female in Washington, D.C. to get a commercial driver's license. She hired an integrated workforce, and so that was, that was very progressive for her time. Um, and also I read just, just recently that um, she would get out into the gardens and help people pick out plants, and then she'd grab a rifle and shoot turtles out of the garden, which because uh, the turtles would eat her, her lilies. So she was a pretty tough lady, too. Um, she traveled the world to purchase new species, and she also cultivated her own species of water lilies. Um, she went to Egypt, Sierra Leone, Ireland, India, England, and France to find different varieties. Um, she was a legend amongst worldwide aquatic gardeners, really well known, a member of all the local D.C. water uh, garden clubs and would frequently speak at them. And she's also a great painter. Later in life, she learned how to paint water lilies um, and there's some beautiful paintings of them in our visitor center. She died in 1957 at 82 years old. Uh, she lost her husband and um, her only child from disease back in 1910. So she, she really just dedicated the rest of her life to the gardens and, and keeping the business going. And at one point in 1936, um, they, the gardens were shipping out 3000 flowers a day um, as far as New York and Chicago and they were usually to hotels, and a lot of times hotels would use them to decorate uh, different parts of the hotel. Okay, all right, next trivia question. Get ready to type here. Okay, how about this guy who's greeting you? Does anybody know what this is? Hey, Kelly. All right. That's a snapping turtle. Yes, we have snapping turtles at the park. Um, some big snapping turtles. And they're known for their powerful bite. Um, they're friendly in the water because they're comfortable in the water. And they can hide. But on land, they can be dangerous. Now, I've never had an issue with them. And I haven't heard of anybody having an issue at the park. But um, they can be known to be dangerous on land. They're omnivorous. They eat plants and animals. Um, they'll take out snakes, fish, and insects. They can live up to 40 years. And in the wintertime, our ponds will freeze over, but they'll be active underneath the ice in the ponds. And they're also the state reptile of New York. So if we have any New Yorkers um, with us today, that's the state reptile of New York. So that's a good old snapping turtle. Okay. All right. So I've told you a little bit about our history. Why did we become a park? Well, the government started to buy up land along the Anacostia River, and they would fill in the marshes, and they built a big seawall. And if you're familiar with Anacostia Park, there's a seawall along the park. And so they would build the seawall and then dredge the river um, and then fill in on the other side of the seawall to make land. And they started to make a park there. And they also wanted to fill in the, the swamps and wetlands because they felt like that was causing malaria. and It was bringing disease to the area. So they started to buy up the land and they got closer and closer to um, where Kenilworth Park is now. And Helen, being a strong woman that she is, she fought it. And um, she fought it and she sued and she did all she could to prevent 
her land from being bought from the government and from the marsh being filled in. And finally, um, after years of negotiation, she relented, but the government also relented and the government bought the land from her for $50,000 um, in 1938. And they made a promise not to fill in the marsh. And it was a, it was a unique agreement. She was able to stay on the, on the property. She lived on the property until she died and she was able to retain her staff and they became part of the National Park Service. Um, the park was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. And um, I've got a picture of one of our historic buildings there. It's a 1913 hothouse um, where we grow tropical lilies, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes, but um, there's, it's still standing there. So if you get a chance to come out to the park, um, it's neat that those buildings have been preserved as close as we can to what they originally looked like. So the park now is, is run by the Park Service. We're open 362 days a year. Um, right now we're eight to 4 p.m. Um, we have 33 acres for the aquatic gardens and the overall park, including athletic fields next to us, are 700 acres. Um, we have a half mile trail and um, a quarter mile boardwalk within the gardens. And you also can connect to the Anacostia bike trail and bike for miles and miles um, all the way up to the University of Maryland or, or south um, to, to the bridge and cross into downtown D.C. So that's that's how we became a park. OK, this is a tough one now. Next next trivia question. Um, is a tougher one. Let's see if we got any birders amongst the group um, here. So go ahead and type in the chat if you can name this bird. This one you don't see quite as often. We have them out at the park. Yellowtail finch, good guess, Kelly. Not a yellowtail finch, but definitely has a yellow tail. It's a beautiful bird. Kind of has a cardinal shaped head with a crown there. Oh, not a chickadee, Bonnie, good guess. Uh, a little bigger than a chickadee. And so if y'all get a chance to come out to the park, especially with binoculars, it's beautiful to see this bird um, up close. Okay, let's see. A couple more things. Anybody got any, another guess? Okay, this is a tough one now. This is a tough one, even for, for some birders. Um, this is a cedar waxwing, isn't it? Cedar waxwing. Um, and male and female waxwings look the same, but it's called a cedar waxwing. Um, it takes them up to a week to build their nest. And they'll take up to 2,500 trips from the ground and other places to build their nest, which makes me think of when I do home improvement, it seems like I go to Lowe's or Home Depot 2,500 times when I'm doing projects. Uh, they have a waxy red tip on their wings, and they love fruit and insects. As you can see, that one they're eating that that red fruit. And a group of wax wings is called an earful, which I thought was a clever name, an earful. Um, a group of cardinals is known as a conclave, and then a group of crows is known as a murder. So there's some clever names out there that um, birders like to use, but a group of wax wings called an earful. So that's a cedar wax wing, so that's a cool bird you can come out and see when you come to the gardens. Okay, so enough of the history. Let's talk about um, what we're known for. And the biggest thing we're known for are our flowers, our lotus and lily flowers. And in the picture here is a lotus flower, okay? And lotus flowers can get up to eight feet high. And you, get, you all being from Washington, maybe you know the tallest ever basketball player played for the Washington when they were called the Bullets before they were changed to the Wizards. Um, can anybody on chat type in the name of the tallest NBA player who was not even eight foot tall? He was short of eight foot tall. Um, so he was shorter than some of our, there we go, Scott, nice work, Manute Bowl. Um, okay, now Scott, can you go two for two? The shortest ever player also played for the Bullets and he's right there in the picture too. Uh, he's from Baltimore. I just thought, yes, Scott, you know your basketball, Muggsy Bogues, very nice. Um, so anyway, the plants will grow up to eight feet tall and they'll come out of the, the mud marsh and, and grow, grow to be that tall. Um, and it's a sacred plant to Buddhism and Hinduism. Okay, very, very important plant to their culture and history, and you see it all throughout um, with their religious symbols. The, the flower is the size of a softball, and it lasts for five days. And after five days, those petals will fall off, and the seed pod will remain, and it looks kind of like a shower head. And um, after a couple weeks, the stalk will die, and the shower head seed pod will turn towards the water and release its seeds into the water. Um, and then next year's seeds will come up. But because they come up from the mud, um, they represent enlightenment, creation, purity, 
and incarnation and beauty um, to, to a bunch of different cultures. Also, um, other cultures believe in their medicinal healing power um, for nausea, fever, diarrhea, and to treat mushroom poisoning. And it's the national flower of India and Vietnam. So the lotuses are, are really great. The peak time is July to see them. Um, this morning when I walked, I saw about a half dozen, well, a little closer to a dozen um, lotus flowers still out there. So if you guys want to come see them, there's still some out there, but they're really starting to fade. And I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be finished with our lotus flowers. But they're, they're definitely beautiful um, to come out and see. Okay, and next are our lilies. And the lilies grow closer to the water. And they come in a variety of colors, pink, white, yellow, blue, orange, and red. Some of them are tropical and some are hardy. And the hardy water lilies are the easiest for us to maintain because they can survive the harsh winters of DC. And they'll, they'll pop up again next year without us doing much maintenance on them. We'll, we'll thin them out every now and then. But they're in our ponds outside. Um, the tropicals, like the ones on the top right there, those are tropicals. Those are grown in our hothouses, like the 1913 hothouse that I showed you. And they have to have a temperature of 72 degrees or more to survive. And so we'll grow them in the hothouse in the winter. And then when the water gets warm enough, we'll bring them out to our display ponds behind the visitor center and they'll grow. Um, they're edible and they're also used as medicine. The ancient Egyptians loved the lilies and you see a lot of lilies in their ancient carvings. And it's a national flower of Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And then at the bottom, you can see some other aquatic plants we're known for. On the left, those are cattails, which I had a, a little fella say they look like corn dogs the other day, um, one of our guests, which I thought was cute, which is definitely true, look like corn dogs sitting there. Um, in the middle is spatter dock or nufar. And those are also known as the yellow lily or the cow lily. And those are our only native lilies. It didn't come from anywhere else. They were, they were local. Um, and they're all over our marsh. And the flowers don't get any bigger than that. They just look like a little yellow golf ball. And that's as big as they get. And on the right, we have pickerel weed. Um, and that's all over the park also. There's, it's starting to fade now a little bit as well. Okay, next trivia. How about this big bird? Can anybody name this one? Nice. All right. Bonnie and Kelly, real quick on that one. Great. That's the great blue heron. Beautiful bird. The great blue spends 90% of its waking hours looking for food. 90% of its waking hours looking for food. So we take it for granted. We can just go to the refrigerator and find food, um, or at least down to the grocery store. They spend a lot of time hunting. They have a 15-year lifespan. They're about four and a half feet high, but their wingspan six to seven feet. Uh, they'll, they'll catch fish, bugs, and crayfish. They do have a predator in the park, it's a bald eagle, which I thought was interesting. Um, I've never seen a bald eagle try to take out a great blue heron, but the bald eagle is the only predator um, around. And it's interesting, in the hot summer days, I've seen them panting, and they'll open their, their bill, and it look like they're panting with their throat, but they're actually just trying to cool themselves. And they'll also droop their wings open to try to stay cool in these hot days. But that's a great blue. I saw three great blues this morning. If you come out almost any time of day, you're, you're guaranteed to see a great blue. Great chance of seeing them. Okay, so some other things you'll see. Um, we've got white-tailed deer. Um, saw some fawns. We had a bunch of fawns in the park, and they're starting to get a little older, but they're still real cute. Um, I see them most mornings. Didn't see one this morning. Um, beavers and muskrats are all over. We have a beaver lodge um, right in the middle of our ponds, uh, right on one of our trails. And so we had a little baby beaver a couple months ago, which is really cute to see. Um, and muskrats will actually live with them in those houses. Um, and then we have snakes, frogs, and lizards. Everybody gets worked up about snakes. Um, we do not have any venomous snakes. We have um, the rat snake, like you see in the picture there, catching that frog. We have a northern water snake and then garter snakes. Um, but we have, we've never seen, I, I haven't heard of anybody um, seeing venomous snakes on our property. So that's, that's a nice thing we don't have to worry about. Um, we also have a bunch of frogs, a bunch of different types of lizards. Um, we get, of course, great blue herons, egrets, um, warblers are going to start coming through as they migrate south, so we should be getting warblers real soon. Um, eagles, hawks. We also get the osprey, which you see on the bottom left there, not the little yellow bird, but next to that is an osprey. And we have an osprey nest in the athletic fields right next to us, so it's really cool to see them. And that yellow bird's a prothonotary warbler, um, which I saw in the spring. Real, real beautiful little bird. So yeah, all kinds of great stuff to see when you come out to the gardens. Okay, this is the last trivia question for me. Can anybody name that animal. Nice, Kelly. Awesome. That is a muskrat. 
Um, a lot of times people will, will come to us and say, oh, I saw a beaver. And it's possible to see a beaver, but more likely you're gonna see a muskrat. And that's why I chose the muskrat. Um, you see them more commonly in our parks. Uh, they're omnivores. They will actually eat small animals, um, fish and birds. Unlike a beaver, which beaver sticks to, to plants and trees. Um, they also eat plants. Uh, they have two layers of fur. They have a slightly flattened vertical tail. So not, not a horizontal flattened tail like a beaver, but a vertical tail that's flattened. It helps it swim. It can swim underwater 12 to 17 minutes. And so at the park, you'll see one and then it'll dive down and you keep looking at, you're waiting for it to pop up and it could pop up you know, across the pond or a whole different area because uh, they can stay underwater so long. And muskrats are named for their strong musky odor that they give out during mating season. They have a musky odor, so that's why they're called muskrats. And they're crepuscular, uh, meaning they're active at dawn and dusk. Okay, so one of the great things about our park is our relationship with the Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. And Megan's gonna tell you more about that, but it's really been wonderful. Um, we did not have this at um, Congaree National Park. We had a Friends group, but they were not as active. And so we're blessed to have such a good group of people to help us out. You know, we protect and preserve the park and keep it running, but the Friends add so much more um, as far as depth and meaning, and also just fun. They have some great events um, that Megan's gonna get to tell you about. And we really appreciate and cherish our partnership with them. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan to tell you a little bit more about what they do. Thank you so much for that intro, Joe. Can you see my screen here? Yes, Megan, we got you. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Joe. I do just wanna um, thank everyone for having me. One of my favorite things to do uh, for friends is talk about the park and talk about the work we do. So I'm really pleased I could be here today. Um, Joe did a great job kind of touching on a lot of uh, the things that I'll probably touch on in my presentation, um, but I did just wanna give you kind of a first person perspective of what coming to the park is like. These aspects, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. It's amazing. You know what? I'm gonna bring my kids this weekend because kids um, really need nature and they have nature deprivation now. Everyone's on their screens and, uh, uh, you know, inside all the time. And we have bikes. We'll bike down from College Park, come here, have a picnic on the weekend. It's just such a spectacular place. So I think um, his enthusiasm in, in seeing the park is kind of a lot of people's first impression when they come. Um, and uh, if you haven't been to the park, I hope you also These aspects, I don't think I've ever seen oh, anything like it. Hold on. It's amazing. <laughs> um, let me just stop sharing real quick so I can... This is the only thing about having videos in your presentation is that you can't like easily <laughs> um, get back to your screen. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yes. We're back. Okay. So as Joe said, we are the only national park dedicated specifically to aquatic plants. Um, there are national parks in other countries that are dedicated to um, like lotus and water lily, but this is the only one in North America. So um, here we are, this big little star here, located in Ward 7 um, in the kind of northwest corner of our not state state. Um, we're located along the Anacostia River, and for reference, that's like right across the river from the National Arboretum, for those who know that. Um, as Joe said, it became a national park in 1938 and was originally, um, or prior to that, I should say, a commercial water garden um, called Shaw Gardens. Um, and as Joe said, uh, this site is located on the ancient grounds of the uh, Nacotchtink, um, who were one of the many Algonquin speaking uh, Native American tribes that called this river home. So um, here's kind of a basic map of the park. Um, you'll see here, uh, it's a series of like interwoven ponds that are separated by this grass and gravel pathways. Um, as Joe said, there is a path that connects you to the Anacostia bike trail, 
as well as a path down to uh, the boardwalk that overlook um, Kenilworth Marsh. You'll find the lotus and the water lilies, of course, but um, as Joe said, there's a bunch of native plant life like pickerel weed, um, crimson eyed rose mallow, cattails, and even for a very short amount of time, you can see marshmallow, which actually was the original fluff, so to speak. Um, the gardens are home to literally hundreds of different bird species, not all at once, of course. Um, uh, most are migratory. Um, and then tons of aquatic life that Joe went um, and talked about. Actually, we did also see a really interesting creature the other day, um, a mink, like the, the fur coat kind of mink. We, we've seen some mink at the park too. So it's really only one of the, the few havens in and around the city um, for these animals. And we're so, so proud to be able to support such a place. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Friends of Kenilworth um, or FOCAG as we call ourselves. Um, it was officially founded in uh, 2001 by a small group of volunteers who were just enthralled by the park's unique beauty and, and unique place in DC history, but it became an official 501c3 in 2007 and now is the official philanthropic partner for the National Park Service. Um, at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. Um, this photo is actually one of the uh, first volunteer crews to come out to the park, and many of uh, FOCAG's founding members are in that photo, which is kind of fun. And real quick, I just want to dive in. You may who know, like, know who we are um, and what we do, but just to be really clear, our goal is to see that this place is well maintained well enjoyed and welcoming for every single person who comes to the park. We do this through our mission, which is to connect folks like you, for instance, to this park. Um, this is done through stewardship, uh, engagement and education, which I will um, touch on in just a minute, but we do this in cooperation with the National Park Service. So uh, the Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens uh, does envision a park that inspires. Um, and this vision is rooted in our 19, almost 20 year um, history at the park. And we do this through engaging community members, um, our volunteers and partners to steward this incredible place. Oops, there we go. Um, our three core missions, stewardship, engagement, and education are fulfilled in a number of ways, um, which are listed here. In a typical year, our stewardship involves roughly like 19 volunteer events with um, 200 plus volunteers and over 3,500 hours of service. Um, we typically sponsor our Youth Conservation Corps to come uh, and uh, work hard to provide regular updated park signage and infrastructure. Um, our public engagement has actually in, expanded this year um, to include the very successful uh, pilot program called Wilderness, which is our outdoor wellness series that encourages people like you to connect with nature um, in this oasis in the city. Um, we also help fund and uh, put on the Lotus and Water Lily Festival alongside the National Park Service, um, which reaches roughly 13,000 people yearly. And we now co-host um, an artist in residency series uh, in partnership with Capital Fringe and Candor Labs called Down to Earth. Um, it features a new artist every single season here at the gardens. So that's really exciting. We also have a monthly photo contest um, and anyone is free to participate. I encourage you <laughs> to participate and show off your photos of the park. Um, and we host a number of special events like uh, concerts in the park. And uh, the last kind of core mission of ours education includes three weeks of nature based camp programming um, with 40 campers. Our survey um, from this past summer uh, told us that 100% so all of our campers felt more connected to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, um, which we're so proud of. Um, but most importantly, we do just want to underline um, who we serve. Yes, we are 
deeply invested in the park, um, but we are also really deeply invested in the neighborhood that surrounds the park. Um, so the closest neighbors to the park have been historically underserved in the past. Um, decades of disinvestment and infrastructure isolation um, have often left many of these uh, residents behind. So FOCAG really um, works on providing programming through volunteering, public engagement, and education to uh, really invest in building connections uh, among those neighborhoods uh, that surround the park. We also serve niche users of the park, um, like those who come just to see the migratory birds, um, those who make their yearly pilgrimage to see the blooming lotus so special to their culture, or even those who just happen upon the park um, as I myself did. But um, when we really get down to the heart of what we do at FOCAG, we um, come back to this quote. I love this park and it feeds my soul. Um, an anonymous donor from earlier this year actually um, said this to us. And uh, it's actually become kind of the unofficial motto for us in the office. Um, and it's the reason we do what we do. It feeds our soul. So um, I actually just threw this picture in here because it's really pretty. Um, I love the park. It's so beautiful. And I wish I could share all the photos with you. Um, but this one is one of my favorites. Um, and I do just want to spend a little bit of time going over kind of the two most popular programs that we have at FOCAG, um, which is volunteering and wilderness. Um, this is some of the hardest work you'll do volunteering, but is also the most fun you'll ever have volunteering. Um, our volunteers um, pick up trash along the Anacostia River, um, maintain pond walls, and uh, remove invasive plants. There's basically always something to um, improve and maintain. Uh, so, you know, whatever you do, it's always something new and exciting. This year alone, we've uh, removed over 130 bags of trash and over 600 hours of service um, have been performed this year. Um, we've collected, oh, I think like six or eight tires from the Anacostia River. And on one memorable occasion, uh, a group of mine pulled out <laughs> a shopping cart from the river. So uh, like I said, it's hard work, but it's fulfilling. Um, just last month alone to, um, we removed over 30 wheelbarrows of invasive parrot feather from the ponds. So um, we expect those numbers to rise as we continue our volunteer programming, but super fun, super interesting. So our newest programming is called uh, Wilderness, which is like wilderness and wellness kind of mixed together. Um, and it seeks to connect folks uh, like you and me back to the outdoors in a safe way that focuses on wellness and healing within and without, um, which I think all of us can agree is something just so vital these days. Um, and it involves a great variety of programming, all kind of centered around peace in the outdoors and calling back to our unofficial motto, um, feeding the soul. So we have forest bathing, Tai Chi, yoga, art therapy, interactive drum performances, pack walks with your dogs, and more. Um, and forest bathing is not what it sounds like, but it is really fun. <laughs> and um, now we're going to play a quick little game, which I encourage you um, to uh, type in the chat your answer, Lotus and Lily. I'm going to show you a photo, and you're just going to type whether you think it's a lotus or water lily. And um, Joe and Melissa, if you could just let me know. Um, what everyone's saying in the chat, that would be great. So I don't want another sad box to pop up. Okay, I got you. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, so this is our first one. Bonnie uh, guesses a lily. Yeah, okay, so Joe gave us a lot of hints. So I'm hoping that you guys will perform well on this, but yes, this is a hardy water lily. Um, this is one of the varieties that actually uh, Monet painted, so um, familiar there at least. On to the next one. Ooh, 
Oh, I see lots of numbers on the chat. Yeah, we have a few for Lotus. Lotus, yes, good. So this is called an Empress Lotus. And um, it's very notable in that it's like this pure white with these painterly pink strokes right on the outside. And this next one, I'm hoping some of these will trip you up because right now you're doing pretty good. <laughs> Oh, okay. This one might have stumped them. Maybe. I don't know. We have one for Lily and one for Lotus. Okay. So it is a Lotus. Yes. This one is called the Chinese double rose Lotus. Um, it's notable in that it does have twice as many petals and you can see kind of the center petals are really distinctive um, and different from the outside petals. I think it looks more like a peony than a rose, but that is the name. Okay, and this one, it's so hard for me not to accidentally blurt out what these are called. <laughs> okay, we have one answer, okay. We're getting, oh, okay, again, we have Lily and Lotus. Yes, good, I was hoping this one would trip you up because I love this <laughs> flower. Um, this is the American Lotus. So this is the only lotus native to North America. The rest of them that we have at the park um, and the rest of them that you see in the world are all native to Asia. So um, the American lotus is located down at the boardwalk um, and it's this very small yellow lotus. Um, and it's my favorite. <laughs> this one should be a little easier. Yep, we have lily. Lily, yes. This is a night blooming water lily. And as the name suggests, it only blooms at night. And um, we actually see these more in the hotter months, so like August and September. So right now. That's really cool. This one should be pretty easy too, but there's something special about this one. Everybody is guessing Lotus. Lotus, yes. This is the Manchurian Lotus. Um, this Lotus is located behind the visitor center in the display ponds. And um, it was actually, so the seeds of this Lotus were found in a dry lake bed in the Manchuria um, location in China in the 1990s. And scientists were like, oh, well, let's just see if we can sprout these Lotus seeds. Like, it's probably not gonna happen. Um, but it did. And so these seeds that had been lost to time um, were sprouted and they grew into this lotus right here. These seeds were 1200 years old. Um, and Whoa. so, yeah, yeah. And so now we actually have them at the park um, for you to see. So this is like a fossil, a living fossil kind of thing. And this one, Joe, I think you may have mentioned this one. I know you did. <laughs> but let's see how well our audience was listening. <laughs> okay. I'm just thinking about it. Okay. It's a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're getting a mixture here. Yeah. So this is uh, in the lily family, it's called spatter dog. Um, and this is uh, located down at the boardwalk in Kenilworth Marsh. Um, and it doesn't really look like a water lily um, when you look at it really up close like this. Uh, but it is in the lily family. And this one should be easy. <laughs> well, I say that, but. Kelly guesses Lily. Lily, yes. Thank you, Kelly. Um, this is Victoria Amazonica. And these lilies get to be up to nine feet in diameter. And they are so strong, you could pop like a newborn baby on it, and the baby would float on these things. And if you're a fan of Planet Earth and David Attenborough, he even does a little um, special on uh, these incredible giant water lilies. We don't have them this year. 
um, but fingers crossed for next year at the park. So normally we have them. And oh, all of these you should see at the park at some point or another. <laughs> okay, on to the next one. We have lotus, lily. Yeah, so this one is a prickly water lily. Um, as the name suggests, it is very spiky. Uh, underneath the uh, flowers and on the out, outside underside of the water lily pad, um, it's full of spikes, but it does not stop our turtles from trying to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> and we only have three more. This one, um, if you're a fan of tea, you may have heard of this one. But it may not be actually called what you think it's called. I think we just have one guess from Bonnie, Lotus. Bonnie, okay, so I'm not gonna say you're wrong because <laughs> in, um, in tea, this blue star water lily um, is actually called quote unquote, the blue lotus. There are no blue lotus, um, but this um, blue star water lily has been um, kind of called that um, in, the, in the tea realm. <laughs> okay, two more. Okay, we have a guess for a lotus, two for lily. Yeah, so I zoomed in on them to try to like trip you up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a hardy water lily that has been propagated to be this lovely orange color. Um, part of the reasons um, that Shaw Gardens was kind of so famous and well known is that um, Walter Shaw and Helen Fowler um, love to propagate new varieties of water lilies. So this is one such variety. Um, that they have made this beautiful, vibrant green. And our last one, this is our, I would consider it our most famous flower at the park, but I'm sure other people disagree. Oh, somebody specifically guessed rose lotus. Oh, okay. So close, close. It's the sacred lotus. Um, and this is kind of the, the lotus that um, people come to see most often because it has, um, this is the specific lotus that has to do with um, enlightenment and rebirth and purity and peace um, in Buddhist and Hindu cultures. So yes, this is the lotus that grows like eight feet tall. Um, and and um, blooms all throughout July, and uh, it's the it's the lotus I think we also have the most of at the park, and it's this beautiful pink color. So um, great job! Thank you everyone for your participation. Um, I'm just gonna quickly kind of outline again the difference between a water lily and a lotus. So the water lilies sit on top of the water, and they don't rise up. Um, you'll see in this picture, they do kind of look like they're rising up out of the water, but that is because the ponds are tidal. The ponds are tidal because the Anacostia River is tidal. The Anacostia River is tidal because of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so you do see the water fluctuate just slightly, but the water lilies sit on top of um, the surface of the water. And they have that very distinctive V cut out of the lily pads. Um, and that's to actually help the water drain off these lily pads so they're not weighed down. Although they do have like a slight waxy coating that um, keeps the water off of them too. But it's that V that really helps with that. In contrast, the lotus, flower and leaf and all, all rise up way out of the water. And the lotus leaves have this really distinctive dome shape you see here. And that helps the water kind of just slide right off of them. And if you've ever visited the park, the um, if it's ever wet, or you can actually just throw like some water from your water bottle on the um, leaves, the water just 
beads right off like it's the best rain jacket in the world and that's because uh, the lotus have what's called super hydrophobic properties which is what keeps them so clean and free of mud so it's kind of like the science behind um the the spiritual section of the lotus and the water lily so um back to friends real quick i hope we've piqued your interest uh with coming to the park but um, I wanted to let you know some of the ways that you can get involved. Um, volunteering is definitely kind of the easiest option um, for folks. Um, you can join us for one of our monthly stewardship volunteer events. Um, but if you're interested in the history and the facts of the park, you can consider joining the Friends um, Pilot Park Ambassador Program. You can also attend an event. Um, the wilderness events are now held from June to October um and uh there's still some spots left i think even for this weekend if you don't have labor day plans um so sign up today because spots are limited um and you can always rewatch some of the virtual lotus and water lily festival content from this past year as well which includes like a restorative yoga class some iphone uh, photography classes and um some really interesting videos about the history of the park and um the uh, plants that the garden specializes in, which Joe is featured in if you'd like to see more of Joe. Um, and of course, like any nonprofit, um, you can show your love uh, by contributing a gift to the friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, uh, because with your help, we can continue the mission to uh, make this a thriving oasis for all and um, continue feeding the soul of the park. So thank you very much. Um, you can also connect with the friends um, through our newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter that lets you know kind of what's happening at the park and what you can expect to see. Um, but you can also follow us on social media for a more like, constant update abbreviated version of our newsletter. Um, both are beautiful and fun. You won't regret it. Um, or you can email us or contact us um, here. Um, I believe Melissa has contact information for y'all if you're interested in. Um, otherwise, thank you. And um, we'll open the floor to questions. Well, thank you both so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And I am so excited to get to the park as soon as I can. Um, we do have a few questions here. And again, just as a reminder, everybody, you can type in your questions into the Q&A um, or you can raise your hand. That should be kind of at the bottom of your screen, the, you know, the option to do so. And I will unmute you and you can ask your own question if you're comfortable with that. Okay. So we have a question from Lawrence. Um, how many, well, a few, how many visitors do you get in a year? What's the busiest time? And is Joe the only ranger there or are there others? That's a great question. Oh, right. oh, I think you should probably answer that one. <laughs> okay, I sure will. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for the question. So we get approximately 40,000 visitors a year. Um, but really it peaks in the summertime. So by far July, so I got here in December um, and we would have days where there'd be more rangers than visitors. Um, you know, very few visitors during the week in the winter time, which is a great time for you to come out and relax and so quiet and peaceful. You know, the flowers aren't there, but um, you see a lot of animals and birds yeah, and just, tons just that. yes. So it's a great time to come out. Um, so the summer, sometimes the busiest time, um, that's where we get the peak number of visitors, sometimes 2000 a day. Um, when we have our festival going on and that on a weekend day. Um, and then as far as uh, rangers, I'm not the only ranger, there's, there's six rangers, four of us are full-time um, five days a week. And then we have two extra rangers that are part-time um, that come on the weekends. And of those rangers, um, three of them are pathways rangers. And that means that they're, they're going through school. And so they're, it's kind of like an internship, but they're, they're going to school and they're also working at the park. Um, so yeah, six full-time um, or six rangers total. And then we've got four maintenance um, rangers that they, they help maintain the park. And so they have, you know, most days we'll have three rangers, three interpretive rangers that, that work with the public. And then two maintenance rangers will be there, um, you know, doing, doing trash and keeping the building going and cutting grass and, and weeds and whatnot. Well, thank you, Joe. <clears throat> okay. Um, Arlene asks, have you ever partnered with the nearby National Arboretum? So there is plans to partner with the National Arboretum in the future. Um, 
COVID kind of changed a lot of things for all of us. So we've kind of taken a reevaluation of what we want to actually bring to the park, but um, definitely it is on the table for us. And I believe there actually is plans in the near future. I don't know how near this future is now with um, COVID and the way of the world. But there eventually will be a pedestrian bridge that connects the National Arboretum to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. So if you're still in the area in a couple of years, um, be on the lookout for that. It's going to be along the Anacostia bike trail. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. All right, and Juliet asked, uh, what are the best months to visit uh, to see the most of the lotus and water lily flowers? Yeah, so um, the month of July is what we would consider peak bloom for lotus, but our hardy water lilies bloom um, from May until like August and September. The tropical water lilies, the more exotic ones, um, we see them bloom more in August and September because they require like the extreme heat. Um, so it really just depends on what you want to see. Um, we have all the beautiful flowering spring flowers like iris and daffodil and all the beautiful flowering trees in the spring. Um, so we actually encourage you to make like multiple trips um, to see how the gardens changes throughout the seasons because it really is quite dramatic and beautiful. Absolutely. Um, Courtney asks, will there be extended hours in September on Friday to see the night blooming lily? A question for Joe. <laughs> yes, yeah, great question, Courtney. Um, and we have done that in the past. Unfortunately, this year, um, we, we had one of our gardeners uh, retired right before COVID hit. And then um, our other gardener with a lot of experience went on COVID leave. He had pre-existing conditions, he was on COVID leave for a year and a half. And so we didn't get our night bloomers grown in the hothouses. We didn't have the experience to, um, people knew how to do that. And so the the Victoria water lily that Megan showed, the huge one, we didn't have that grown this year, or do we have a night bloomers grown? So um, hopefully 2022 in September, we will have our extended nights um, to come out and see the night blooming lily, but unfortunately not this year. Yeah, that does happen on like normal years though. <laughs> and it is something you should definitely do. Um, Ranger led tours at night are something um, to definitely be experienced. It's incredible. Um, okay, so we don't have any other questions. I'll give folks like just a moment to think up anything else, but um, just so everybody knows, I did put uh, the website, the newsletter, link to the uh, newsletter, Eventbrite. Um, I have social media handles in there for both friends and National Park Service, uh, Kenilworth social media. I don't see anybody's hands raised, and I don't think. I haven't seen anything from Zach from Facebook. Okay. Um, well, we do wanna thank you all for having us. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure um, to talk about the gardens. Um, I encourage you to come out multiple times a year to see how the seasons change this park um, and I hope that you find as much peace and uh, tranquility as uh, we at Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and at the National Park Service do. Well said Megan we really appreciate your time and your participation you guys have been great thank mm -hmm. you so much. Well thank you both so much this was again really wonderful it was amazing to learn about the gardens and then just all of the amazing work that's going on there to uh, preserve them and to take care of them. The shopping cart was surprising. It <laughs> was wild. Um, but yeah, no, and I, again, just want to echo that. I encourage you all to get involved and to, you know, visit the gardens, maybe participate in some of these great events that are coming up. Um, and I want to thank the friends and the National Park Service for coming to speak to us today. Um, so with that, I think we're going to start closing out here. Again, the links are in the chat. We'll, I'll stick around for a little while in case anybody wants to copy those. But again, you can, you can uh, visit the website, uh, the Friends website. Um, and before we officially end things here, I just want to remind everybody what we have coming up for our 50th anniversary. So next month, our theme is actually along the river. 
But I think this is a good transition into that month uh, with our first uh, program being a boat tour along the Anacostia River with the Anacostia Watershed Society. So I think we will be passing by the gardens close to over there. Um, you so, will, you will. Yeah, so we'll make sure to wave. Maybe folks can stop by and, and come to the gardens afterwards. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what we have coming up. You can learn more about that on our website, dcpreservation.org. And with that, I just want to thank you both again so much for speaking to us today. And I want to thank everybody for joining us and participating. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you at future events.